All right. Thanks for coming today. We have a few upcoming webinars on our schedule. I'm going to link to our website just for the sake of time. We've got a packed agenda today. Just want to say welcome to everybody on behalf of the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health. We're pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, Keeping Cool at School, Addressing Indoor and Outdoor Heat Standards to Protect Workers. This is a panel webinar moderated by Monique Hossein and Laura Stock from the Labor Occupational Health Program with presenters Mitch Steiger and David Hornung. All participants who logged in with their registration email for the full live presentation today will receive an email tomorrow with a link to an evaluation form that will qualify participants for a certificate of completion worth one continuing education contact hour. You will be muted during this presentation. If you would like to ask a question, please enter it into the Q&A box. We will save time at the end of the presentation to address as many questions as possible. This presentation is also being recorded and will be available on YouTube at the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health YouTube page within five business days. So now I'll introduce our moderator for the first half of this webinar, Monique Hossein. Dr. Monique Hossein is a coordinator of public programs at the Labor Occupational Health Program here at UC Berkeley. Her project portfolio includes leading the Worker Occupational Safety and Health Training and Education Program and School Action for Safety and Health Program. She has a background in mixed methods research through the lenses of health equity, race, and gender. Very pleased to have you, Monique. I'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Will, and thank you all for being here. Of course, my opening question, as you may have seen on the flyer, is, is it hot in here or is it just climate crisis? So thank you for being here to learn more about the impacts of indoor and outdoor heat on worker health and safety and how Cal OSHA standards in place can be implemented to address working conditions for school-based workers. So a little bit first about the programs involved, the issue before us, and introductions to my fellow moderator and our two distinguished panelists, to whom I will turn things over in just a minute. And thank you again to the Center for Environmental and Occupational Health for ho hosting this webinar series. So the Labor Occupational Health Program at UC Berkeley, LOHP, has a vision of healthy jobs. Healthy jobs are jobs that pay a living wage, provide job security and benefits, protect against hazards and harassment, have reasonable workloads, engage workers in decisions that affect them. We believe that those are a basic human right. We believe that workers have a right to return home from work in the same condition in which they arrived. One of our main areas of work is training for action, building worker capacity and training employers to take action to improve working conditions. And one of those programs, SASH, that you heard about, the School Action for Safety and Health is administered by the Commission on Health and Safety and Workers' Compensation, we call them Chiswick, um, in the California Department of Industrial Relations through an interagency agreement with LOHP at UC Berkeley. We also have partners um, at UCLA at Loesch. And SASH focuses on health and safety for school-based workers. Hence the focus of today's program, but we think it will be widely applicable. Um, these standards apply to all employers. One of our emphases at LOHP is on centering and involving workers as experts in developing strategies for improving working conditions. So we're here because temperatures are rising and workers are at risk from the number one weather-related cause of death in the U.S. Uh, my co-moderator, Laura Stock, is the director of LOHP and has dedicated her career to improving worker safety and health in many arenas, from curriculum development to advocacy, policy development, research, and we are thrilled to have her with us this afternoon. Our, other, our panelists, David Hornung of Cal OSHA, one of our illustrious panelists, he is a proud golden bear. He earned his MPH at UC Berkeley School of Public Health and is here to share his expertise in his capacity as the Cal OSHA Statewide Heat Program Coordinator. We are also thrilled to welcome our other illustrious panelist, Mitch Steiger, the legislative advocate for CFT, a union of educators and classified professionals affiliated with the 1.7 million member 
American Federation of Teachers, and through it with the California Labor Federation, AFL-CIO. His expertise in advocacy will help us address the issues of how we go from legislation and standards, rights, and legal responsibilities to improved conditions for workers. We are so pleased to have them here today. Keep those reactions coming. Keep those questions coming in the Q&A function. And I will turn things over to David to get us started with your presentation. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you, Monique. And thank you to LOHP for inviting me today. I uh, appreciate this opportunity. I'm the uh, statewide heat program coordinator for Calish. I've been now with Calish for 15 years, which kind of blows my mind. I'm located here in Sacramento where it's gonna be 103 degrees today. They may be canceling my daughter's uh, soccer practice today. That's that's the trigger temperature, 103 degrees. So really excited to talk uh, about heat. Uh, this last month, I've been giving a version of this talk to groups on the indoor heat regulation, but typically I have an hour to do so. And today I just have 20 minutes. So I had to just trim and trim all my material down and include really the most important aspects of the new heat illness prevention regulation for indoor environments. Uh, the regulation does have some nuance, which I can't cover all of today, but what I hope to give you is the resources that you'll be able to use later to learn more about the regulation. Quick reminder about Cal OSHA's role in worker safety. In California, Cal OSHA has jurisdiction over almost every place of employment. Uh, and while we care a lot about students, uh, my oldest is just to, about to enter middle school, we don't have jurisdiction over student health and safety. But we do cover many workers that could get sick from heat in schools, including custodians, janitors, cafeteria workers, maintenance workers, PE teachers, groundskeepers, coaches, crossing guards, bus drivers. And we have an enforcement unit that responds to complaints about heat or any other workplace condition. And that enforcement unit also investigates accidents. Separately, we have a consultation unit that is free and can help employers improve their safety programs. And I'm gonna plug them again later today. Before I talk about our indoor heat regulation, I wanna remind everyone why heat matters. I borrowed this data from the National Weather Service and you'll see here that heat is by far the leading climate related killer. And climate change in California is causing heat waves to be hotter, longer, and more frequent. I just read that July was the hottest uh, month ever recorded. And what's also happening is there's less overnight relief, which is it's not cooling off as much as it used to at night and allowing people's bodies to recover. In California, the best estimates we have show that there are about a thousand workers a year that are getting diagnosed with heat related illness from their work and filing workers' comp claims. So what is heat illness? It comes in sort of a wide range, uh, variety of forms. It can be really mild and it can also be life-threatening. So it progresses through heat cramps to heat exhaustion to heat stroke. So heat cramps is really the mildest form. It's where your muscles are cramping up and that could be in the legs or abdomen. That's often accompanied by heavy sweating. Heat exhaustion is more serious and can develop after a single day or several days of exposure to high temperatures. The symptoms include heavy sweating, weakness, dizziness, and headaches. Perhaps some of you on this call have experienced this. And then heat stroke is the most severe form of heat illness and is really a medical emergency. It's marked by high body temperature above 103 degrees, confusion, slurred speech, seizures, and loss of consciousness. It's crucial that all workers recognize these different symptoms and can take appropriate action. So for heat cramps, that action would just be resting and hydrating. For heat exhaustion, that'd be often moving to a cooler environment, cooling the worker down. And then for heat, heat stroke, it's really a medical emergency and you have to call 911. In schools, those most at risk of heat illness are those that are gonna be doing strenuous work in hot environments. And those environments could be the kitchen, gym, maintenance areas, or working outdoors. Now, before I dive into the indoor heat regulation, I wanna remind everyone of the requirements of our heat illness prevention regulation in outdoor place of employment, 3395. And this regulation has been law in California now for 19 years. It's been updated and strengthened twice in 2010 and 2015, but it hasn't changed for the last nine years. 
And really the ways to prevent heat illness hasn't changed in a long time. It's really to provide water, rest, shade, and training. The regulation requires that employers not only provide water and shade, but also they encourage employees to drink water and to take cool down rests. It requires the employers to have a procedure if someone gets sick and to call 911 if someone has severe symptoms. It also requires a written program and training. Here in California, we have about 1.4 million workers that are expected to be impacted by this new regulation. And that's a lot of workers. It's roughly the number of workers in the entire state of Hawaii or New Hampshire or Maine. Uh, this regulation is gonna have a huge impact. It's estimated to affect about one in eight workplaces here in California. And I think what's great about this regulation is when employers implement the requirements of the standard, not only are they gonna make it safer workplaces for these 1.4 million workers, but they'll make them better places to work because I think it's really difficult to work in hot environments. And I personally am really excited to see that change. So what's in the new standard? So the indoor regulation was designed, it went through many iterations, but the final one was designed to be very similar to the outdoor standard. Uh, and you'll see here, both have requirements. They, they have the scope definitions and then a water and cool down area section. But then the biggest difference here is in subsection E, this high heat procedures. Uh, so the outdoor reg has high heat procedures and then the indoor has something entirely different, which is this assessment and control measures. And I'm gonna spend the most time talking about the regulation on that section, because I, I think that's the most important section. And uh, similarly, these have similar sections on acclimatization, training and written program. And I'll cover all those sections. So this regulation has been in the work for about seven years, and it was finally approved just two weeks ago, which I think is so cool. And I wanted to take a moment to thank all of the people involved in getting this regula regulation passed, but in particular, Mitch Steiger, who's on this call, and also Laura Stock. Back at, in March at the Calusha Standards Board meeting, many people thought that this regulation would be voted on and passed, but just before the meeting, there were some concerns that surfaced about the cost of implementation of the regulation, specifically in prisons. So this made the Mar March meeting a bit unusual with advocates voicing their concerns and their frustration that regulation might not be passed. And I wanted to share two short clips and hopefully the sound works. We tried this before. Uh, the first is of Mitch Steiger talking about SURIAs or the standard regulatory impact assessments. It's pretty offensive to us because those SURIAs took a lot of time. They took years. There were two of them. And during that time, we had members in boiler rooms, in industrial kitchens, in tool sheds, suffering through this hazard, dealing with the impact of it while we were telling them, don't worry, help is coming. They're doing something. I just wanted to add a few. And then the next clip is of Laura Stock. She was one of the seven board members on the Kalisha Appeals Board, and this is during that same meeting. I just wanted to add a few comments and, you know, it is clear that the public is angry and and who can blame them and i and, and and i think other board members here are equally angry and frustrated by what happened and in my mind it undermines the entire process of what we're doing here so later in that board meeting the board voted on and passed the regulation However, it took a few more months for the regulation to be revised to exclude prisons, get re-voted on in June, and then again, it finally got approved by our Office of Administrative Law, or OAL, just two weeks ago on July 23rd. So this is like, this is as fresh as a regulation can get. Uh, when this got passed by OAL, it went into effect immediately. So right now, this is the law in California and has been for the last two weeks. So now on my next slides, I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna cover what's in that new regulation. First, like most of our new regulations, we have a scope and a definition section and the scope section defines when the regulation applies. So the regulation as a whole would apply when indoor temperatures are above 82 degrees Fahrenheit. So if it's below 82 indoors, the regulation 
doesn't apply. Subsection E, which is that section that requires feasible engineering controls, only applies if the temperature or heat index is above 87 degrees. So subsection E, it also applies if it is 82 degrees and employees are wearing clothing that restricts heat removal, think of like Tyvek suits, or it's 82 degrees and it's an area with high radiant heat. So that would be workplaces with ovens or furnaces or boilers. So these are the triggers for when the regulation applies and also when subsection E applies. So that's 82 degrees and 87. Following the scope section, uh, there's a whole definition section. It's really long. I'm only gonna read two of those definitions, the ones I think are most important. The first are engineering controls. And that means a control device that removes or reduces hazardous conditions or creates a barrier between the employee and the hazard. And the definition, I like it a regulation, we include a lot of different examples of what engineering controls are. And really these are a list of potential solutions for employers. So here are some of the examples they give. So isolation of hot processes or isolation of employees from the heat source. That'd be like putting the hot equipment in a different room from the workers. Installing air conditioning. Installing cooling fans or evaporative, evaporative coolers. These are like swamp coolers. Increasing natural ventilation. That'd be opening the windows, getting, if it's cooler outside, bringing that in. Or adding local exhaust ventilation, uh, like you would over a stove to suck the hot air outside. A lot of different engineering solutions are out there. And the nice thing about this regulation is it allows the employer to choose what is going to work best for them. We also define indoors. In our outdoor regulation, outdoors was not defined. And it took the courts eight years to resolve whether a non-air conditioned bus was considered outdoors or not. So I'm really glad for a definition of indoors here. And I'm going to read that definition. The definition is a space under a ceiling or overhead covering that restricts airflow is enclosed along its entire perimeter by walls, doors, dividers, or physical barriers that restrict airflow. Also in the definition, it states that if work areas are not indoors, then they are considered outdoors. So this is great. You can't have any employers claiming that their work area is neither indoors or outdoors. You're one or the other. So. In ag, we've talked a lot about hoop houses and what those are. I was thinking about for schools, I think you know, places that are kind of on that border, you don't know if they're indoors or outdoors, would be like open maintenance bays where you're doing repairs on vehicles. Typically, if those it's a building that's all shut up and then during the day you roll up the doors, I think those are probably gonna be considered indoor locations. And then the other place would be like covered PE areas where they're you know, out, outside, but have roof coverings could get really hot. I think those are probably going to be considered outdoors. Uh, and I think most of the other spaces are going to be pretty clear. But again, the, the regulations for indoor and outdoor are both very similar. So now you'll have protections, whether you're indoors or outdoors. The requirements for water are very similar to the outdoor regulation which is that the employer needs to not only provide, but encourage employees to drink water that's fresh, pure, and suitably cool. And then the water needs to be located as close as practicable to where employees are working. And for indoors, also where the cool down area is. And a cool down area is the equivalent of shade for the outdoor regulation. There has to be one area of the facility where it's less than 82 degrees, where employees can go to cool down. And like the outdoor reg, employees have to allow and encourage workers to take a cool down rest to protect themselves. All right, and here's the most important part of the regulation, subsection E, the assessment and control measures section. So it's split up into two section. E1 is, you can think of it like the trigger or, or whether or not, that's the assessment part, whether or not you'll need to do E2, the control measures section. So under E1, you first have to measure the temperature indoors. You got to figure out how hot it is. So you measure and record the heat index, uh, whichever is greater. And during this measuring or assessment step, employees and their union, if they have a union, should be involved in this step. So if you determine it's above 87 degrees, or in those cases, the heat index is above 87, or it's above 82, and you're in it, 
place with high radiant heat or wearing Tyvek suits or similar, then you have to do E2. So E2 requires first that feasible engineering controls be implemented to lower the temperatures. If those aren't enough to lower the temperature below 87, then you have to implement feasible administrative controls. That would be like rotating workers or limiting the amount of time a worker could be in that area. If those aren't enough, then feasible personal protective heat equipment, uh, heat protective equipment must be used. So these might be cooling vests or wetted garments. So again, that order is first feasible engineering controls. If those don't work to lower the temperature, then feasible administrative controls. And then lastly, the personal heat protective equipment. Now subsection E2 is flexible in that it is not requiring controls that are not feasible. And I think we're gonna have a lot of discussion in the future about what feasibility means. And it's something that's not defined in our regulation. We've had a lot of discussions previously about it because we've had many regulations like noise exposure and lead exposure that have used the term feasibility. I'm just gonna mention two today. One is technical feasibility. That's whether there's a solution that exists to it. And the second is economic feasibility. That's whether the company can afford the cost of the controls. Are they financially viable? And again, in the coming years, I think we're gonna have a lot of discussion on, on exactly what feasibility means. So going down to the next section, subsection F on emergency procedures, means that if a person gets sick, you need to address it immediately. And for mild symptoms of heat illness, that could be having the employee cool down in the cool down area, but for severe symptoms like vomiting or losing consciousness, then 911 should be called. Both indoor and outdoor have an acclimatization section. They're very similar. They have two triggers and then one requirement. So the two triggers are if there's a heat wave or if you have a new employee that's going into a hot condition. If either of those, then you trigger the requirement that they be closely observed. The goal here is that if someone's more likely, uh, if they're unacclimatized, not used to the heat, they're more likely to get sick and you wanna have someone checking on them to make sure that they are getting sick, they can provide some first aid. The last two subsections of the indoor heat regulation, again, similar to the outdoor regulation, says training needs to be provided to both employees and supervisors, and you need to train them before they start working in those hot environments. And then the indoor regulation requires that all employers with hot environments within the scope of the standard have a written program, and that program can be combined with your outdoor program. In fact, the model program, which I'll give you a link to later, has both indoor and outdoor hazards combined into one program. So both the heat training and the written program can be combined. You can do it at once. So in my last two minutes, I wanted to share a couple resources. The first is our heat illness uh, Kalosha page, and I'm gonna pull a cut that up here on web. So if you type in like Kalosha heat illness prevention, you'll come up with our main page. We have links to the regulation. We have links to other webinars that are coming up. And we also have a comparison table of the indoor and outdoor. If we scroll down all the way, we've got a number of different materials, including model programs and FAQs. We also have a page 99 Calore that's really focused right now on outdoor heat illness prevention, but we do have a lot of free materials. Actually, LOHP helped us create those materials many moons ago, uh, and they're, they're really, really gorgeous materials. And if you check out 99 Calore, you can check out the resources page. And if anybody wants any of these materials here, they can just email me at heat at dir.ca.gov. We'll mail you all the materials free of charge. We are currently out of these pocket guides. We're ordering more. Our budget for the new fiscal year just opened and we're working on ordering more. So you can request them and we'll send them to you when we get them. Uh, let's jump ahead a slide. Uh, National Weather Service, their heat risk map is being used more and more. Uh, and it's a really cool web page and it doesn't show up great on a shared screen. But what it is, it's color coding for different places of California showing the different risk of heat illness. 
And it allows you to go forward in time to see whether that risk is going down or going up. And I think what we're going to see is Cal OES and other government agencies are more and more going to rely on this, the heat risk map. Uh, it's a it's a great tool. Uh, we use it within Calosha um, to both protect our employees and determine when we should be going out in the field to make sure workers are safe. Lastly is our Calosha consultation service. It's a totally free service you can use. We've got a lot of uh, real experts there that can help you with your programs and help make uh, safer workplaces. So I think that's my 20 minutes. Thank you. Uh, again, appreciate the time uh, to speak. Yeah, um, thanks so much, David. I'm gonna jump in a second before Mitch um, starts just to um, let participants know that thank you for posting wonderful questions in the chat and I'm gonna be monitoring them. Um, we may answer some of them um, through the question and answer, but actually I mean in the question and answer button, not the chat. But we're gonna first hear from Mitch and then he, because he may be answering some of the questions um, that come up and then we will have at least 15 minutes at the end, um, hopefully to go back to some of your excellent questions. So I just wanted to let people know that we will be trying to get to as many of them as we can. But now I can turn it over to Mitch. Thank you so much, Laura. I really appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to speak today. I, I was really hoping the Cal OSHA presentation was going to be some sort of really stuffy, boring <laughs> review of the regulation, and I was going to seem really exciting and engaging by comparison, but no such luck. David did an amazing job. That was a great presentation, really covered the standard very well. And uh, yeah, if you knew nothing about it going into this, you now know pretty much everything you need to do. So um, thank you so much for covering all of that. So yeah, my name is Mitch Steiger. I'm a legislative representative with CFT. We're a union of about 120,000 education workers here in California. We represent certificated workers, teachers. We also represent classified workers, uh, janitors, bus drivers, paraeducators, everyone in between. And so we cover everyone throughout the school setting. Uh, I've been here for about a year prior to that. I was with the California Labor Federation for about 13 years where we did a lot of work on the indoor heat standard. Uh, this um, has been a, a, an, an issue that, that just, one of those ones that just kind of keeps going. We didn't think it was going to take quite this long, but we're very glad that we're here. And I'm very fortunate to have been a part of this eventually successful campaign. So uh, I, this is kind of a catch-all presentation designed for ones that aren't necessarily following such a great presentation that went through the details that you just heard. So there are a lot of slides in here that get into the details of the regulation. I will skim through those as fast as I can and avoid as much as possible duplicating any of the great information that, that David put out there. So I'll talk a little bit about the history because I think it is kind of relevant to where we are now and how the standard ended up. I'll really quickly go through any key provisions as they relate to schools and then talk a little bit more about how this standard and how the hazard of heat connect with schools and the school environment and then finish up with how we do best to empower workers to help enforce this standard and make sure that it does what it's supposed to do in a way that's fair to employers. And the bug on the bottom right is the union that I'm a member of, the field representatives union uh, here at CFD. Can we do the next slide? So this came from SB 1167 that was a Senator Labor bill for most of the year in 2016. The campaign was originally led by warehouse workers and, and a lot of others, but the more that we talked about the standard at the Labor Fed, the more that we realized there really isn't anyone who works indoors that's always safe from this. It's definitely a more pronounced hazard in some places than others, but it very much does affect everyone. And there's also a very uh, wide variety of workers out there. Some can just handle heat and it doesn't seem to affect them. Others uh, suffer much more pronounced negative effects early on than others for a variety of reasons. And, uh, you know, there's acclimatization. So there's no real simple way to say it's a big deal for these workers and not those over there. The campaign pretty quickly became something that needed to cover everyone. I also mentioned the employer opposition because their, their perspective was always that they felt it was unnecessary given that we have the IPP standard there in, in statute and in regulation where employers are required to go through and identify hazards and do something about them. But our position was always, as much as we appreciate that being in law, 
there are some specifics around the issue of indoor heat that mean getting some sort of a specific regulation in place is going to benefit everyone because employers will then know what it is they need to do to best keep workers safe. The the issue, well, the incident that really led to this for us in a lot of ways was a case in warehouses where two workers suffered a heat illness at a warehouse and the employer was definitely doing things. It wasn't like they did nothing. They had fans, they had some water, but there were also a lot of things that that employer did wrong, where maybe if we had had a regulation in place and we had some effective training in place, that employer's efforts would have been more effective in preventing those workers from suffering the exposure that they did. So no one likes being told what to do by the government, but we do think it was very important in this case so that we have the specifics that David just went through so that uh, employers know, all right, I do this, I really focus on this. This is the most effective way to keep workers safe. Also, just a kind of fun quirk of history, the bill almost died because of an issue where the sponsor of the bill had endorsed someone that was not an incumbent in the other house, in the assembly. And it created a lot of uh, conflict between the houses who did not like the fact that someone from the other house had endorsed an opponent. One of the reasons that that endorsement happened had to do with climate change that the author of this bill felt that another candidate would have done more on the issue of climate change. So ironically, for a climate change related reason, this bill came very close to dying, but it was uh, transferred over to another senator, uh, Senator Mendoza, toward the end of the session and was eventually passed and signed into law. Uh, next slide. So the advisory committees began in 2017 and the employer opposition continued and the statements uh, uh, were also, you know, along the same lines of we don't think this is necessary. There were also a lot of statements that it should be narrowed to certain types of workers. And our intent uh, was always to make sure that every worker who needs to be covered by the standard would be covered and that the standard could be as strong as possible. Obviously, the more that it's narrowed, the more specific it can be. But because there really isn't anyone who works indoors that's always safe from this hazard, we really felt like we needed to get the best language that we could that would cover everyone. And the regulation that was eventually approved, we think did a great job of striking that balance. Uh, next slide. And so uh, David went through the uh, all, all the fun that happened earlier this year in March, and um, it did happen on June 20th. It, it took effect a few weeks ago and uh, it was a, a bumpy ride, but we were eventually uh, successful in getting it approved though. Corrections workers are no longer covered. Uh, as was mentioned, the bill, the regulation was pulled back uh, the night before the hearing when we were all getting ready for our flights down to San Diego. We found out, oh, guess what? It's dead. They're not going to actually approve it tomorrow. And the reason was because of costs that uh, the Department of Corrections felt it, they were going to have to experience to comply with this. We uh, respectfully but strongly disagree with their assessment of what it would cost to comply with this. But um, anyway, it was all settled out, and now there's another process running alongside this to figure out some sort of other way of protecting those workers in corrections. Probably very few, if any, workers in schools are going to be affected by that, though there may be some that go into teach in juvenile facilities. I'll talk a little bit about that later, but for the most part, you know, school workers are still in this and still taken care of. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, the key provisions were all covered very well. I think we can probably just go ahead and skip this whole slide. Um, these were all taken care of. Let's do the next slide. And then I did also want to talk a little bit about feasibility and effectiveness. I know David did get into this and talked about um, technical feasibility and economic feasibility. So this was the, this is something that you see in other standards, but it was a really important one here because as much as we would have liked the standard to say, all right, everyone's got to bring the temperature down below 82 degrees, figure it out. Nothing like that would have ever gotten passed. The legislature wouldn't have liked that. Uh, all of those in charge of approving regulations probably would have had something to say about that. And there are some circumstances where that would be extremely difficult to do. And so rather than trying to go through each one of those different individual circumstances, there is this language in there that says things like the employer has to do this unless they can demonstrate that it's infeasible or they have to do this thing to the extent feasible. And what exactly that means is going to be different on a case by case basis. And Hopefully, uh, you know, reasonable people can come to some sort of an agreement on that. 
There probably will be down the line some disputes that go before the Cal OSHA Appeals Board to figure out what is and isn't feasible from a technical and an economic point of view. But we, we do very much applaud Cal OSHA for settling on the language that they did, and especially for wording it specifically where the employer has to demonstrate infeasibility for the engineering and administrative and PPE controls. We think that will help encourage employers to really go as far as they can to keep workers safe from this hazard. And also with effectiveness, kind of the same thing where, you know, we think much better than going through and saying, all right, the training's got to be this many hours. Uh, you have to give a test afterwards to make sure everyone was paying attention that it, it could really become unworkable pretty quickly if you put it down that road. So just having some sort of a general effectiveness standard in there to make sure that if you do give a training and then the next day there's a heat illness incident, Cal OSHA shows up, finds out no one knows anything about this. No one remembers anything that probably the training wasn't as effective as it should have been. And so uh, that that may be an issue for that employer. So while it is not the the ideal to have the, you know, a lot of these disputes settled by fairly broad terms like feasibility and effectiveness, we do think it's the best option among a universe of not great options in terms of figuring out how to best protect workers. And we think, uh, you know, it was the best way to go and it should work out pretty well. Um, David covered the rest. Let's do the next slide. And so just wanted to pause on this one for a sec. This is just kind of how my mind works. When people ask me what's in the heat standard, even if I just read it, it's like I, my mind just kind of goes blank. Like I, training, uh, there's other things in it. It's really helpful for me to have all of them there in a list and summarized. And David did do this as well. But just, you know, if you want to take a, a screenshot of this with your phone or something, if, if folks ask what is in there, it's always helpful for me to have just a list of the main topics that are covered so that we know, you know, it can kind of, once you've read the standard, you can look at these and it can kind of jog your memory as to what the individual pieces of each one were, but that just having them all in one place is helpful. So I just wanted to have that there. But David did a great job of walking. He did very effective training. I'm telling everyone what these are. So uh, next question, next slide. And so uh, David also did a great job of covering heat. I did want to speak a little bit about how it affects the school environment. So, and we bring up, we bring this up a lot when we talk about the need for this standard. So we think the evidence is pretty clear that excessive heat does harm cognitive function among human beings. I just read a study yesterday where they found that above 32 degrees Celsius, I always have to plug it into a calculator, which was 89.6 degrees Fahrenheit, on a cognitive test, uh, a human being's ability to perform on that cognitive test declined by 10% compared to baseline down at room temperature. And so, you know, the standard's at 82 and 87 degrees. By the time you get to that 87 degree level, uh, you're not remembering things as well. Your brain is not processing information as well. Um, you know, you're you're not as able to remember the words that you need as you were before. Um, things that you learn may jump out of your head quicker, um, and that uh, that applies to both the teachers, the paraeducators, and the students. So the teachers are having a tougher time. The students are having a tougher time. And if you're a classified worker doing some sort of maintenance, it could be dangerous maintenance. You might be on some sort of dangerous machinery. Well, that's also a really bad thing. You might be needing to make really good, really quick decisions to keep yourself safe. And now you're, you know, if it's 90 degrees, you're 10%, at least according to that study, 10% less able to do that. And so as short of the fatalities that were mentioned, which are very real and something that I'll talk about in a sec, that, but long before you get there, there are a lot of problems that we think are really specific to schools that mean it is really important to do something about this hazard and bring it down as much as we can so that schools can do what they need to do as well as they can. Um, and then uh, David did talk about the lasting damage. This is a hazard that can, it can damage your kidneys, it can damage your heart, other internal organs, it can be fatal. There's also some evidence that it can increase the risk of violence, which is another very serious issue in schools where we're dealing with a lot of violence uh, from, from students with behavioral health issues, other very, we have very sensitive relationships here in schools where, where we spend a lot of time on de-escalation, trying to prevent violent incidents from occurring. And then, you know, along comes an extreme heat event that can make all of that a lot harder. There's also a lot of evidence that even indoors, when it's hot outside, it still increases the risk of violence indoors. So um, it's another it's another weird little quirk of this hazard 
that's not as often discussed, but we think is very real. And it's also an issue with recruitment and retention. The more uncomfortable people are in schools, the less likely they are to want to work there, the less likely students are to want to stay there. And so it's another reason we need to do something about this. Uh, next slide. And so um, we did talk a little bit about everyone being covered. I did want to just quickly touch on fans. So th this is a, an issue I'm painfully familiar with. The room I'm sitting in right now, uh, there is an air conditioner right here that doesn't work very well. And so I never turn it on. It's very loud and it doesn't really cool things down. So uh, I'm in Sacramento. So whatever the temperature is outside is basically the temperature in here. And so I've got a complicated network of fans to keep me cool on hot days. But once it gets above about 104, fans can be counterproductive. They don't really change the temperature. They just move the air around. And once the air gets above your own core body temperature, all the fan does is blow that hot air into your body quicker. And so we've heard a lot of talk from a lot of our members about this is the way that uh, a lot of folks try to deal with heat. Oh, it's hot. Put a fan up. It does help. It is great. And it's effective up to a point. But once it does get hot enough, it can be something that actually sends things in the wrong direction and can make heat illness a greater hazard than it was. Uh, next slide. And so as far as how to put this standard into action and get us to where we need to be, this is a very new thing. It's only been in place for a few weeks. And so uh, as we've heard from a lot of our members and activists, a lot of school employers may not even be aware this has happened. And if they are, they may not be aware of the full extent of this standard. And it'll probably take a while to get everyone up to speed on what's in it and what they need to do. So. We probably got a long way to go in most schools. Uh, I, the vast majority of workers don't know this is a thing. So we're in that kind of education stage of getting the word out that this is out there and getting the word out about what the specifics of the standard are. And to that end, there are a lot of great resources available online. Cal OSHA has done a great job of developing an FAQ. There are there have been a few Zoom webinars that have already happened. I'm sure David would be happy to go get presentations to anyone about um what what's all in the standard and fortunately as complicated as it may seem we think the standard is actually pretty straightforward you don't have to be an attorney to go through and make some sense out of all of it so just sitting down and reading it we think would probably answer most questions there's not a lot of reading between the lines on this one and so that's we think a good place to start uh next slide and so uh as always, when something does happen, the first issue is always student and worker safety. It's more important than running the risk of angering a supervisor or angering another union that you didn't check with. If it does look like someone is suffering heat illness symptoms, that's the priority that needs to be dealt with. Um, don't be afraid to call 911 if it's necessary. Get people to the cool down area, get them water, do what you need to do. And um, that's always the most important place to start. If it's an organized workplace and you're a worker experiencing heat illness issues, I, I, I've been in the labor movement most of my life and have found that with things like this, it, my vote would be the best place to start is with a union rep, that getting them involved and making sure that uh, they are there speaking for all of the workers rather than one person going forward and being the mouthpiece is usually the best option. Every workplace is different. Um, you know, every union rep is different. Every worker rep is different. There are definitely cases where the best way to deal with it is to go for an individual worker to go straight to the employer. But overall, uh, I think it's safe to say that in, in my experience, what I've seen work the best is going to a union rep and having them being the mouthpiece for things like this when it comes to direct interaction with the employer. And it's also good to coordinate with other unions on site. There are, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten unions in the education world in California, sometimes several of them in one school. And so before doing a whole lot with any given issue, it's always good to check in with them if possible to make sure that you're not duplicating something that they've already done or doing it in a different way that might be counterproductive to both. Always good to keep everyone involved. Next slide. And so when it does get to the point where a complaint is necessary, maybe informal efforts with the employer haven't worked out the way that uh, they should. As always, documentation is key. It's good to send emails explaining what the problem is, keep track of those emails so that there's a clear written record. 
of efforts to try to address the problem. There are formal complaints and informal complaints to Cal OSHA. It, I think, is safe to say that formal complaints are, are the best option if someone is willing to put their name on it, whether that's the union rep or someone else, that someone that anonymous complaints are a possibility. But as far as getting the kind of action that everyone would hope for from a very overworked Cal OSHA inspector, it's it's always best to have a formal complaint if a worker is, is willing to do that or if the union rep is willing to do that. Not all union reps are going to be aware of this already, and certainly not all stewards are. And so there may need to be kind of a co-education process there where the worker who really cares about this and the union rep help each other learn more about this standard and what's in it as they figure out what it is that's not being done that could be done better to keep workers safer. And the process can take a while. That Cal OSHA inspectors do amazing work, but they are very, very much overworked. There are not nearly enough of them. And so, and the process itself takes a while. And especially if it's a serious complaint, it'll probably be appealed. And, you know, it's not going to be over in a couple of days. That this can take weeks, months, or sometimes more than a year to get all of this settled out. But just to stay involved and be patient and do what you can to stay to stay plugged into the process, but know that it's um it's not going to move at lightning speed. And as far as parent organizations, I mean parent literally, like a parent of kids. I'm on my son's school side council, and that's the kind of organization where if a complaint process isn't working out the way that it should, teachers, there are always ways for teachers to go talk to uh, parents. Like I've always, when I start the school side council, go to the teachers and say, if there's an issue here at the workplace, you don't feel comfortable bringing it up to the principal, come talk to me. I'm happy to bring it up to the school site council. I don't work for him, so it's a different relationship. There are, I think, a lot of parents out there who are more than willing to help the certificated and classified employees at a school get what they need. And so that can be another avenue if the complaint process isn't getting the results that it needs quick enough. Uh, next slide. And so as far as feasibility, I think it. I would argue that it, it's probably harder for schools to claim infeasibility given their size. You know, these are not employers of two or three people, though they are always, uh, you know, there's never enough money for all the things that that we need. And so there is that concern to keep in mind. But where it is something that, oh, we're at time. All right. Um, one minute warning. Uh, well, let me see if there was anything else that I wanted to focus on. I uh, really wanted to drill down on this point that David made about and quote the standard here about employers shall allow and encourage workers to take a preventive cool down rest uh, when employees feel the need. I think that phrasing is really important. So don't let anyone talk you out of feeling like you need to go to a cool down area. Uh, it doesn't matter if everyone else is doing fine. You may not be. And it doesn't matter if you were or weren't encouraged. Uh, the way to avoid this is when you start having symptoms, make sure you do what you need to do to keep yourself safe. Get to that cool down area, get the fresh, pure and suitably cool water in you as quick as possible and uh, do that first. And then we'll go from there to try to make sure that the standard is enforced the way that it should be. And I think that's my last slide. Yes, there is my email and cell phone. If anyone wants to contact me, I'm pretty easy to reach and happy to help however I can. Thank you so much, Mitch, um, and thank you, David, for two excellent presentations. Um, I'm very sorry that we don't have more time because I think both of you had a lot more to say, but we appreciate the, the information that you provided. Um, and um, so I wanna go through some of the questions in our remaining time, and David, thank you. I know that some of the questions that were put in the Q&A um, have been answered, so I would encourage people to take a look, but there's some that are, have not been so I'm just gonna go through a few of them in the remaining time. And I noticed that there's quite a number of questions that are associated with acclimatization. Um, and, and so I thought maybe we could start there. There's a, a number of questions about, you know, how does it get implemented? Is it enough for employers to provide new, uh, to observe workers or do they have to give them less demanding tasks? Um, and um, so, so maybe just uh, David, if you could just add a little bit more information about what is required for climatization, what Kalosha would be looking for, and what are the various ways that should be done. So why don't we start with that one? Yeah, so I, I think I, I went through that section really quickly. So 
the, the the acclimatization section recognizes that unacclimatized workers are at a higher risk of heat illness. Back when the standard came out, we looked at I think about 25 heat illnesses that occurred at Cal OSHA's, many of those fatalities back in 2005 and 2006. What they found was over 90% of those fatalities, workers were in their first, second, or third day of work. So workers are, are at a must, much higher risk of getting heat illness. Your body does all these wild things to adapt to heat over a period of four to 14 days when you're exposed to the heat, such as you get a higher plasma volume, you've got like more blood, so you've got more sweat. You sweat differently uh, and more effectively. So your body makes all these adaptations, but in that time period where you're adapting, you're at, you're at higher risk. So our regulation only requires a one thing, which is close observation. That is, the goal is that a supervisor cannot just send a worker out alone when they're unacclimatized. They have to have a method of observing that employee to make sure that they're doing okay. And if they aren't doing okay, because they've been trained on signs and symptoms of heat illness, they can recognize that and tell the person, hey, why don't you slow down? Why don't you take a break? It looks like you should drink some water and can do that. Unlike Oregon, which I think has better acclimatization regulations, we do not require specific, like you can only work two hours on your first day and four hours in your second day. Kalish's regulation doesn't require that. It just requires the close observation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, um, David. And there's another question that came in about training. And, and again, this may be sort of broadly applicable to other issues about does the supervisor training have to be separate or different from employee training if there's existing training that covers the elements relevant? So again, maybe, you know, there's like, does there have to be a separate program, a separate training program, or can it, um, would it be sufficient to have it integrated into some of the other programs or trainings that are being delivered? Well, maybe I'll take a stab at answering what the regulation requires and, and Mitch can share what he thinks is best practice. Uh, so the regulation just requires both, both be trained. Uh, I think many employers are doing that training all at once. The way the regulations both of them have is they have a, a top section, which is like 10 items and it says, employees and supervisors need to be trained on this. And then there's a separate section below and it says supervisors also need to be trained on these additional things. So there's a few extra items that supervisors need to be trained on. Um, Mitch, do you have anything you wanted to add to that question about training? Well, I, I guess the, the main thing is that, that we hear about there where different standards require training is that the new law comes into place, the employer finds out about it, and then it happens. And then where where things kind of fall, is, fall apart is when new people get hired. And that, that's the one piece that really needs to be really needs to be emphasized that as new people come in, we can't just hope that the word kind of trickles down to the new people and leave it up to employers to figure out the best way to do that. But that it is really important to, you know, so a lot of workplaces have 50% or more turnover over the course of a year. And so while it doesn't require annual training, it does require that employers kind of stay on top of staffing to make sure that that everyone has, has gotten it, that that's really the main thing that, that seems to limit the effectiveness of training in reality out there. Right. Thank you. Um, so I know we were running out of time. I want to make um, general again. Um, I'm going to try to get to one or two more questions before time is up. Again, take a quick look at the question and answer box because some of them have been answered um, in there. And I also want to just mention very briefly that LOHP is actually currently doing uh, involved in doing a lot of outreach and education around heat, developing training programs, connecting with organizations that want more training. So um, I want people to encourage to reach out to LOHP. Um, we can both try to direct or answer questions that didn't get answered today and also share with you some of the resources that we're developing. So a couple of other questions that are in, um, in there is some questions about the 82 and the 87 threshold. If you could just quickly kind of clarify the difference between those two. Sure, yeah, and, and I've, I definitely hear from people trying to implement that, that it is a challenge because there are a lot of different triggers now. The outdoor regulation uh, is applies all year round, regardless of the temperature, but it does have two triggers in there. It has an 80 degree trigger for when shade needs to be up and present and out. It also has a 95 degree trigger for high heat procedures. 
And now for the indoor rag, there's two more triggers that are in there and they're different than the outdoor rag. And that's part of the rulemaking process. It's just everybody has a, a different trigger temperature that they want it to be. And there's negotiations that go on to try to compromise. So the two triggers first off is the regulation applies when it's greater than 82 degrees. That's the whole regulation except subsection E, which is the engineering controls. So everything but subsection E applies above 82. Then subsection E has three different triggers. And that's, I think, where it gets really complicated. So the first trigger is 87 degrees dry bulb temperature, which is just like the temperature you'd measure with a, therm a normal thermometer or what you'd see on your weather app, 87 degrees, or 87 degrees of a heat index. And the heat index is something the National Weather Service developed, which is like the feels like. So on the East Coast, uh, the feels like is always hotter. Like if you're 80 degrees in California, it feels very different than 80 degrees in New York because of that high humidity. People don't sweat as much. And in high humidity environments, it feels hotter. So for instance, at, I'm, I'm not gonna have this exact, but like 84 degrees uh, dry bulb, if you've got high humidity, like 80% humidity, it feels like might be 90 degrees because it's because that humidity makes it feel hotter. So 87, 87 degrees, either temperature or heat index triggers the engineering controls. And then there are two other ones where it's 82 and you're wearing uh, heat uh, protective clothing uh, or the traps in heat. So like Tyvek suits or any full body coveralls where heat can't, uh, can't escape. Uh, the idea being that as you're working in there, you sweat, but your sweat's not evaporating, you get hotter. And then the other is places that have high radiant heat. So that is recognizing that if you've got like a big furnace over here, or if you're cooking in a kitchen, you've got flames, that those are providing radiation heat and that that is hotter. So again, in those environments, that trigger for engineering controls is going to be 82 degrees. So sort of four different triggers in there. Uh, hopefully that provided a little bit more clarity. Thank you, David. And I, I know we're at the end. We're we're out of time. I know there's a bunch of questions. I see some questions that are about the implementation date, and I think you answered specifically that it's in effect now. But there's some questions relative to what will count. You know, is there a grace period while people are developing this program? So I would encourage both our speakers, David and Mitch, have provided their contact information, and so. I think that that means that they're welcome if you had questions to reach out to them. Um, and, and as I said, we encourage you to reach out to LOHP. Um, thank you, David. David is putting his email in the chat. And so I think he's obviously a really good contact to be able to work out the ins and outs of the enforcement of this regulation. And there's been other really important questions about like our school buses, indoor heat and things that have come up that we didn't get to. So thankfully there's a lot of resources out there um, and, and I would put LOHP in that mix as well. Please reach out to us. And maybe um, if um, Monique, if you want to put, you know, your email in the chat as well, if it's not already there so that people have a way to reach LOHP to find out about how we can support your efforts to implement this standard and how we can work with you to provide education and training about its provisions. Um, and I want to thank, you know, our speakers for, you know, uh, Mitch, for your incredible advocacy and leadership over the years. We would not have this regulation literally without your effort behind the scenes. And David, for your really, you know, committed to being sure that this is enforced, and that people understand what the regulations are. And so thank you so much on that. Um, and actually in the in the chat is the email of Alejandra Domensign from UC Berkeley LOHP, and she is coordinating LOHP's heat illness uh, uh, outreach and education program that we have started this summer. So you can be in touch with her with questions about that. So with that, I wanna just thank everyone, um, for all the participants for coming and for our amazing speakers for all the work that you have done and are continuing to do. Thank you so, so much for being here yeah. today. Thank you. Thanks so much.